From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Immigrants are at the center of a national debate over policy and rights. We take a look at their impact on Arizona's economy. Plus, the art of recovery. We take a look at how some are working to overcome addiction. That was the wrong lesson, was not to tell the people what war was really like. And lost in time, a Vietnam veteran is sharing his story now. Years after serving overseas, he's coming under fire in a new way. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Tyler Paley. And I'm Victoria Mendoza. Thank you for joining us. President Donald Trump is having a working dinner tonight with leaders of Latin American countries. That's following his first appearance at the United Nations General Assembly. And as Trump's immigration policy continues to take center stage, Cronkite News reporter Nicole Gutierrez took a closer look at immigrants and their impact on Arizona's economy. Foreigners in Arizona have demonstrated to contribute to their Arizona economy by creating businesses that leads to jobs. Tortas Paquime is a family-run business in Phoenix that has fueled the state's economic growth by sharing their Mexican culture. I know the difficulty of, of being an immigrant. I came here after high school. I, I went to college in this country. I graduated, I went to Mexico, started my own business over there and came back. Operations Director of Tortas Paquime, Jesus Alvarez, is of the immigrant population who hopes to cultivate emerging leaders. Share what I've learned in my personal experience at other jobs and also in my, my career as a, as a business administration uh, um, major, I think that it's important for, for everybody within the company to grow and to learn and expand their knowledge on how to be a better leader. You can't have economic growth without immigration. Garrick Taylor from the Arizona Chamber of Commerce says immigration plays a key role in the Arizona workforce. Fifty percent of our working population in Arizona uh, is uh, U.S. born. And according to NewAmericanEconomy.org, the foreign-born population is 70.5% of that working population. For the past three years, Alvarez has overseen five store locations and a recession. Not too long after the recession, a uh, year or two, we opened up a, a, a location and we just invested in keeping good quality and, and also giving good service. Tortas Paquime celebrates their 15th year anniversary this year, but it's it's not just their authentic Mexican food that keeps their business going. I think that it's important as immigrants to have a good attitude and as a director of our operation, my responsibility is to irradiate that uh, good attitude, that positive attitude and that uh, hope that everything is going to work fine for my employees. Tortas Paquime has more than 80 employees at the moment and the franchise plans to open two more locations by the end of this year. In the broadcast center, Nicole Gutierrez, Cronkite News. People with disabilities can sometimes feel left out or unable to access certain resources. So several organizations came together to focus on the Latino community, hoping to fill that need. Cronkite News reporter Alex Valdez was there and shares the kind of impact events like these can have. It was a day filled with inspiration, information, and resources for a part of the Latino community that needs it most. Over the weekend, Ability360, along with Chicanos por la Causa and AARP, hosted an event geared towards those living with a disability. Jose Ortiz Reyes has seen firsthand the impact this kind of help can have. The most important this is because people got information what I need to do and for to modify the service to living great and living well. The second annual summit is the only one of its kind in Arizona and was created to show those with disabilities they are not alone. With over 50 different bilingual exhibitors on site, it was a one-stop shop for those who wanted to get informed. The Latino community has a different culture and they don't reach out to the services. So we can, we want them to come over. And while the event was open to everyone, Cavasso says they want the Latino community to know there's help out there should they need it. They're not the only one living with a disability and they can have an independent living. They can live a, a, a life full of happiness, enrichment. 
In Phoenix, Alex Valdez, Cronkite News. Ability 360 is a fully accessible facility in Phoenix that is open to anyone with disabilities and their loved ones. For more information, you can visit their website, ability360.org. We continue our coverage tonight on Arizona's opioid health emergency. The state is getting a $3.1 million boost to help fight the problem. Across the country, the U.S. Department of Health Services is giving more than $144 million to states. The grants will be used for training first responders to use overdose reversal drugs and improving access to treatment. And a new story from the American Academy of Pediatrics is showing a growing number of kids and teens are addicted to opioids. Researchers saw a 54% jump in ER patients under the age of 21 diagnosed with opioid dependence. Between 2008 and 2013, researchers say the final year of the study looked at more than 130 kids were testing positive for opioid dependency at ER departments each day. And the Arizona Department of Health Services just released the latest numbers on suspected opioid deaths and overdoses. Since they started tracking it back in June, 310 Arizonans are believed to have died from opioids, with more than 2,700 others overdosing. In that same time period, they say nearly 2,000 doses of an opioid re reversal drug have been given out. September is National Recovery Month, and opioid abuse is at an all-time high, but addiction can be overcome. Cronkite News reporter Sierra Delgado looks into why it has become such an issue. This past summer, Governor Doug Ducey declared a state of emergency because of the opioid epidemic in our state. Deaths from prescription drug-related overdoses has been on the rise for the past decade. Someone who understands how opioids can become addictive is Austin Eubanks. I was one of the injured survivors of the Columbine shooting that happened April 20th, 1999. Um, and by way of that, I was prescribed opiates. Um, at that point, I had never smoked weed. I had never drank a beer. I was 17 years old. And within a matter of weeks, I was in active addiction without even knowing what was happening. According to the CDC, opioids have killed more than 33,000 people in 2015, which is more than any other year. And in Arizona, at least two people a day die from opioids. Stephanie Siete explains that although there are antidotes like Narcan available to reverse these overdoses, the drugs can still be too powerful. But with something like fentanyl, and a lot of these drugs are unknown and undetected at the time of the overdose, it can take two, three, four, five, you, you just don't know, hits of Narcan, and does the first responder have enough? So it's, it's, it's helping save lives, but it won't save everybody. There are outlets like recovery centers that can help address this addiction, like Crossroads. People such as myself who have gone through the program and now work for it, have a vested interest. We truly believe in this program and, and it saved my life, so I truly believe that it can help somebody else. Eubanks believes that education about this crisis can help others know the effects. Talking about the way that opiates affect emotional pain is incredibly important because I believe if I would have had the knowledge to actually know that I was medicating emotional pain, I would have been able to stop it earlier on. Not dealing with emotional issues can be a trigger for relapse. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the relapse rate for drug addiction is 40 to 60 percent. In Phoenix, Sierra Delgado, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is dedicated to covering the opioid crisis. Our documentary, Hooked Rx from Prescription to Addiction, highlights the problem of painkillers in Arizona. Find resources for getting help online at hookedrx.org. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey has offered his support to repeal Obamacare. Ducey says the proposal known as Graham-Cassidy is the ideal replacement for the Affordable Care Act. The proposal would put an end to the Medicaid expansion and instead offer tax subsidies that help lower-income people buy private insurance. Senator Jeff Flake also backed the proposal, and Senator John McCain says he will reluctantly vote for the proposal if it is supported by Ducey. It was advertised as the mother of all rallies. It called on Americans to gather in Washington to show support for President Donald Trump. Cronkite News reporter Adrienne St. Clair caught up with Arizonans on the National Mall. Hundreds of people from across the country attended the mother of all rallies on the National Mall in Washington. While the goal of the event was to show support for President Trump, speakers and supporters had some choice words for Arizona Senators John McCain and Jeff Flake. Glendale resident Tawny Gonzalez agreed with one speaker who called for McCain's resignation 
and endorsed Flake's challenger, Kelly Ward. Um, Jeff Flake will be replaced by Kelly Ward, and we need McCrazy out of there. He's a traitor to our, our country. He's a traitor to our state. He does not represent Arizonans. Concerns with the senators were not the only Arizona issues here. People from all over brought up immigration, DACA, and the recent pardon of former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio, which New Yorker Brian Elbaz called the right thing to do. Because I'm glad that he got pardoned because he was doing his job and doing it well. Nearby, a small group of opponents included Bruce Gomer. He'd been in Charlottesville, Virginia last month, where Heather Heyer was killed protesting racism and white supremacy. That's why I came here, to be sure that I stand up for, you know, what happened in Charlottesville. The neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, you can call them whatever you want, patriots, but I want them to know that we're watching them and they're not going to, you know, ever take over this country. Gomer said this event was nothing like Charlottesville. When Black Lives Matter protesters showed up, for example, rally organizers invited them on stage to speak briefly. That's an opportunity that Gonzalez said she and others at the rally don't often get from mainstream and social media. Okay, so what's going on is a lot of the patriots are under attack right now. And anything that they say that it's offensive to the left, they completely ban them for 30 days. But for this one day, people here said it felt good to stand with like-minded people, what Gonzalez called her fellow deplorables. That included former Arizona resident and Tea Party organizer Jim Griffin. I'm not stopping until I'm in the ground. And when I go, I'll be a proud American in the ground for God and country, Christianity, capitalism, and the U.S. Constitution. On the National Mall in Washington, Peter in St. Clair, Cronkite News. A soldier who served during the Vietnam War is telling his story. That's right. Coming up on Cronkite News, how his new views on combat are leading people to call him a communist. Plus, a Valley school district is putting a classroom on wheels. Find out what creative movement they're hoping to grow. When a story comes in in the morning, we're out the door as fast as we can go. But it's also great to spend more time in communities and produce projects. From the borderlands to the cities, the reservations, and even the state capitol, we want to get to the heart of the matter. When the lights come on in the studio, we know our hard work is about to pay off. We love what we do here at Cronkite News. We're proud to tell the stories of our state. Now more than ever, it's important to have a trusted news source, and that's Cronkite News. PBS airing Ken Burns' documentary on the Vietnam War, an Arizona veteran is speaking out about his time overseas. Drew Marine is in the broadcast center to explain how his views caused controversy back home then and now. As a paratrooper, Dennis Stout saw firsthand the death and destruction that happened during the Vietnam War. He spoke about that when he returned, garnering death threats. He told me those threats have started up again with the airing of the documentary, despite his family's many years of military service. Our family, um, our family, every, all males serve in the military. In fact, my mom was a whack during World War II. So, and, and she also worked in a defense plant. So our family always believes in service. We feel we owe a debt to the country to do that. Despite his family's tradition to serve in the military, Stout had many opposing opinions of day-to-day -day life during the war. Every month we were guaranteed one hot meal, one shower, and one change of clothes a month. So the rest of the time we were just in the jungle. Day-to-day -day living was the hardest part of a year in the war. And their impact on civilian communities. I don't know how anyone who's ever actually seen a war could want another one. I mean, seeing all the people killed, not just the enemy. I mean, way more civilians get killed. Far more mothers with their little kids and old people. People who are trying not to get hurt. Which is why he decided to speak up after being discharged. Two weeks later, I was going to ASU and I joined the anti-war movement. I was the first combat veteran 
they'd ever had joined the anti-war movement because I thought the war should be over. And many people weren't pleased by his anti-war messages. In unison, we're saying, communist, communist. Even death threats couldn't scare Stout out of speaking his mind on these issues. I got lots of death threats. I had so many telephone death threats. I know actual killers and they wouldn't call you on the telephone to warn you they're going to come kill you. They would ring your front doorbell and shoot you. They wouldn't, they wouldn't mess around like that. So I didn't take telephone threats serious. All these years later, Stout says this is his final attempt to bring justice for the Vietnamese people who he believes were wronged. He reached out to me after our interview to say that the documentary company had received phone calls concerned that there might be anti-war speech in his episode of the 10-part documentary, and Ken Burns planned on calling him after it airs to check on him. In the Media Center, Drew Marine, Cronkite News. New episodes of the Burns documentary on the Vietnam War continue tonight and run through Thursday, Thursday, Thursday night here on Arizona PBS. The Avondale School District created a new educational environment for their students, and it's already hitting the road. Crockett News reporter Madison Connor went to find out what kind of movement the district made. Not only can you go on a school bus, you can go on a school bus that is a maker lab, and they can get on and do some activities and, and to extend their learning in a different way. Avondale School District found a way to not only include the arts in their STEM curriculum, but to put it on wheels. What if we took all of these really great STEM and STEAM resources and being able to put them into every one of our schools? Well, that, that wasn't quite possible. But what if we took all of them, put them in one spot, and actually have it move around our district? The idea was created for students who are unable to stay after school for those science, technology, engineering, arts, and math classes. All sorts of amazing STEM and STEAM activities that kids can do while it's parked right outside of their school, or maybe parked in their apartment complex, or at one of our city functions, or a side tech festival throughout the state. Basically being able to take these awesome opportunities right to where our kids in community. We really think that a lot of the challenges the world faces today will be solved through science, technology, and engineering and mathematic type solutions. But of course we want to keep that passion for the arts in this as well. This mobile STEAM lab can be spotted around the district, allowing students to have hands-on time with technology. In Avondale, Madison Connor, Cronkite News. Hurricane Irma left a trail of destruction in Florida that left millions without power. Coming up on Cronkite News, how the valley is seeing red to help out as Florida cleans up. It is a nice and sunny 98 degrees right now outside. For the rest of your seven day forecast, stay tuned after this break for more. Now available for the annual Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism Luncheon. Held Thursday, October 19th at the Sheraton Grand Phoenix. Join media industry and community leaders in honoring award-winning co-anchors and co-managing editors of the PBS NewsHour, Judy Woodruff, and the late Gwen Eiffel. To learn more or to purchase tickets, call 602-496-0482 or visit cronkite.asu.edu slash luncheon. This fall. I'm so excited! What? <laughs> from the inspiring to the amazing. We're in the presence of history. The compelling. He said, welcome home. It was just a powerful moment. To the astounding. <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> and from the breathtaking. This is real. A journey to Mars. To the electrifying. We're going to change the world. All this and more. All this fall. As parts of Texas and Florida work to get back to normal following devastating hurricanes, hospitals are in desperate need of blood donations. As Nikirika Marinier reports, two organizations here in the Valley teamed up to help out. The recent hurricanes in Texas and Florida affected the country's blood supply. Blood drives that were supposed to be scheduled in those states because of the hurricanes um, didn't happen. So American Red Cross lost um, their blood supplies that would have came from those blood drives. With Red Cross's supply at critical levels. Thank you. Thank you. Volunteer and blood drive planner Christine Aguilar knew something had to be done. Scheduling a blood drive takes um, at least three months. Um, for American Red Cross, they have to 
um, schedule their staff. So that's what takes a while. However, the Red Cross, in collaboration with the Phoenix Salvation Army, was able to schedule staff and find donors in only one week. Nancy Dila was a part of the collaboration efforts. It's really important right now because um, people that would normally give in the areas that have been affected aren't able to give, and so the ongoing needs for blood and plasma exist. I definitely don't like to watch when they put the needle in, but other than that, it's not too bad. Grace Barkley is a Salvation Army employee who left work to make a contribution. Something really important, and if I can sacrifice, you know, half an hour and an hour to help some people, then I definitely will. Aguilar feels that today's drive goes beyond just giving blood. Right now, our country really needs to come together and lend a hand to anybody who needs it. And obviously, Texas and Florida really need the help. Aguilar says that with blood levels being as low as they are, all blood types are in demand. In Phoenix, I'm in Kiriko Marina, Cronkite News. There were 20 donors at today's blood drive, according to Scott Johnson, public relations director for the Red Cross. He says each pint donated can save three lives. It's been one week since Hurricane Irma slammed Florida, and things are slowly getting back to normal. I'm happy, joyful, now I can cook. <laughs> Eva Johnson is just one of the many happy people in Jacksonville who now have power again. Last week, the hurricane caused a lot of damage in the Florida city. In other parts of the state, many kids returned to school today after more than a week off. Meanwhile, the Hollywood nursing home where eight people died during a power outage is being sued for negligence. And another storm is brewing in the tropics. Hurricane Maria is now a Category 4 storm as it heads towards the Caribbean. Forecasters say the storm's sustained winds have more than doubled since Sunday. Meanwhile, our temperatures are feeling a bit more like fall. That's right. Christiana Fadul is in the Weather Center with today's forecast. It is a nice and sunny 96 degrees right now. There are a few clouds in the sky and a humidity of 10%, but again, it's pretty, pretty warm outside. Now moving into the entirety of the state, there is a contrast between our northern and southern regions. Up in the north in the Grand Canyon, it is a beautiful 74 degrees and pretty chilly 69 degrees in Flagstaff. If I were you, I would take the family up there this weekend for a nice picnic. Now moving in more into the valley, we are seeing the temperatures a bit higher than up in the north. But over the next three hours, they will be dropping just a little bit with 82 in Whitman and 86 in Levine. Now let's go into our seven day forecast. Now, bad news, friends, it is going to be 100 degrees tomorrow, but don't worry, it's going to get a little bit cooler the rest of the week. Moving in through all the way to Monday, we are going to see it drop to about 92 degrees with a nice low of 67. For Cronkite News, I'm Christiana Fadula in the Weather Center. We celebrate the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, but what about celebrating the Constitution? Coming up on Cronkite News, a little civics lesson to honor the document signed 230 years ago. It's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Human beings are a curious bunch. What are we going to see when we get really close? Wow. Oh my God. Absolutely spectacular. We are at a remarkable moment. Yes. We're going farther than any exploration ever has. Every September 17th, the U.S. celebrates the anniversary of our Constitution. But we the people don't seem to know a whole lot about Constitution Day, as Cronkite News reporter Frazier Allen Best in our Washington Bureau found out. 
How did you spend your Constitution Day? If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, you're not alone. I talk to people walking out of the National Archives where the Constitution is permanently on display, and even they drew a blank on the day. I didn't remember the day until I was in the, uh, the, in the National Archives. <laughs> no idea that that was happening today at all. Uh, I actually found out on Facebook, but uh, yes, uh, I knew uh, as, of, uh, of, uh, as of about uh, 10 o'clock this morning. Sunday was officially known as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. Well, Citizenship Day has been around for a long time, Constitution Day was added in 2004, aimed at educating Americans about the historic document. Ilya Shapiro is senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute. He said, the day is important, but not as important as the document the day is supposed to remind Americans of. It's less important that on, on any one particular day that people think about the Constitution. I mean, for me, of course, every day is Constitution Day. It's what I do for a living. Shapiro said Cato has distributed five or six million copies of the Constitution in recent years, but he's optimistic that the day is reaching people. I'm hoping it's right up there with at least Arbor Day or Flag Day or something like that. Speaking to Americans outside the National Archives, that feeling is shared. I actually wasn't aware that there was a Constitution Day, but I'm all for it. In Washington, Fraser Allen Best, Cronkite News. That'll do it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks so much for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.